This is Magic and How to Fix It. This episode, Love and Other Potions, read by Molly O'Donnell. Eve rose from the oven, carrying the smell of a freshly baked pie. The scent was dull on Maribel's senses, but a habit brought her to take in a big whiff. The crust had browned perfectly, and the cherry filling bubbled through the holes in the weave. She closed the oven door with a sense of pride and placed the cherry pie on the windowsill to cool. She pulled off her oven mitts and untied her apron strings. A heavy emptiness settled in her chest. She surveyed the apartment. Dishes piled in the sink, a rolling pin, mixing bowl, pots and pans. A pre-prepared coffee mug sat on the tray in front of the cubby, with mismatched mugs that lined the wall. Most days she felt downheartened. There was a small, empty pit inside of her chest, and nothing had ever filled it. But, like every day, she pushed those thoughts to the side. She moved the stack of cookbooks from the dining table. She dressed it in a fresh tablecloth and placed a vase with a bouquet of assorted roses in the centre. Everything had to be perfect today. Her darling Teddy would be home later, and any feelings of emptiness she felt throughout the long day would slip away until the next where the cycle would, inevitably, start over again. The door swung open, and he stepped in. He was early. Maribel rushed to the door to greet him. She smiled at him brightly as he greeted her with a weary nod. She held out her arm, and he slung his jacket over it. How was your day, darling? She asked, while she hung his jacket up on the rack. He didn't respond to her question. He had time to bake a pie, but not to wash up after yourself. Sorry, she said, defeated. I, I was absent-minded. Her body moved through the daily motions. Cleaning, serving coffee, setting the table. Dinner was awkward. They sat across from each other at the dining table, as they always did. Knives and forks clanked above the silence in the air. She felt that emptiness in her chest, heavy like a black hole. He had barely eaten a thing. He simply sat with a vacant look about him, pushing his food around the plate. How is it, Tony? She asked. I'm not hungry. He placed his cutlery down. Just take it away, he demanded. She did as commanded. The gift bag that she had prepared for him was on the counter. She smiled briefly as she imagined his face as he opened the bag. How he would smile at her with his bright brown eyes. Happy anniversary, darling. She placed the bag on the table in front of her. He locked eyes with her, unspeaking. Go ahead. Open it. Sit down, he said. Open it first, she said, smiling softly. Don't make this any harder than it has to be. Is something wrong, darling? Time seemed to slow. It's okay if you didn't get me anything, she said with soft, innocent eyes. She hoped he would believe her lie. Hoped that he did get her an anniversary gift. Hoped that he did remember. But the look in his eyes and the growing silence between them said otherwise. Did I do something wrong? Her voice trembled. I, I can change. I can fix it. I can change. I can fix it. I think we should break up. Don't do this. Please, not today, she whimpered. Be quiet and listen. He slammed his hand down on the table. Tears streaked down her cheeks and pulled at her chin. She avoided his gaze and allowed him to speak her worst fears. Your presence is suffocating. Her mind felt distant as his words tore at her reality, her empty existence becoming even emptier. You suffocate me. He produced a small vial from his pocket. The liquid was clear and iridescent. It seemed to scatter the light across its own shadow in all different colours. She was mesmerised. Her mind emptied as the liquid sloshed and swirled. 
His voice was dampened in her ears, like she was laying in a bath and her head under water. We should break up, he repeated, his words a tired whisper that pulled her out of her trance. What is that? she asked, her eyes completely fixed and focused on the inviting glow of the liquid. He placed it on the table and slid it toward her, stopping just short of the full plate in front of her. Drink it, he commanded. Her unsteady hand rose and then hovered, unsure. But what is it, darling? It's an antidote. She looked up quizzically. Are you unwell, darling? The antidote to a love potion. She furrowed her brows. He rolled his eyes. Do I have to spell everything out? You're under the spell of a love potion. No, that can't be true, she protested. Can't it? Tell me the story of how we met. What, what does that have to do with anything? Do you even remember anything before a year ago? I, uh... Her mind tumbled in search of a morsel of a memory. Her mind was filled with nothing but him. He was her whole life. How could he say such a thing? What do you know, anyway? He said. Drink it. Don't drink it. I don't care. Just be out of this house by tonight. He stood up and held her gaze for a few moments. She was in two minds. Something inside of her desperately wanted to drink. But she couldn't mm. believe it. But darling, how? Stop calling me darling, he yelled. His body was shaking. His words sucked the air out of the room. Her heart pounded like she was staring down a dragon. We're over! I don't love you anymore! Fine, she thought, as she inspected the potion. She lifted the vial to her lips before she could think better of it. First drops tasted... bitter. Then her senses flooded in, dizzying her. Piece by piece her memories came together. Little moments she had never appreciated in the moment, like family dinners selling cakes at a bake sale, her best friend's laugh. Bigger moments that she cherished dearly, like her first kiss. Or when she received an apprentice letter for a patisserie experience in Telxia. Her eyes welled. Tedrick Sloan. I thought you were a horrible little man. Now I know you are the scum of Astaria. She spat. You didn't seem to mind last night. He threw his head back and laughed. Her blood boiled beneath her skin. Her body tensed and her hands curled into fists at her side. Fingernails dug into her palms. The kind of man that she loved had dissolved in front of her eyes. Now in his place was a selfish monster with a goatee shaped into a point. How? Dare you take me hostage like this? You pathetic little man! You should be thanking me. She wasn't surprised at his lack of remorse. She lifted the vase and threw it with all her might. It shattered on the wall, launching shards of porcelain through the air. Water dripped down the wall, and roses lay bruised on the floor beneath them. He barely even flinched. Get out of my house. As if I want to waste another moment here with you. But something stopped her as she made to leave. Curiosity, perhaps. Why now? Why did you free me? Maribel asked. I've met someone else. I don't need two of you draining my resources. And she realised how he could do something so evil. He never even considered her to be a person. Women were to be used and then... thrown away. 
I wonder if she even knows you exist. I hardly did. You were nothing. Insignificant. And you always will be. She quickly made for the door, slamming it behind her. She rushed out into the evening and clambered down the streets directionless. She leant against a wall and caught her breath for a moment. It was only then she realised she had left without so much as her shoes. She stood in the light of the first light tea room. She'd worked in a cafe like this once as a teenager. It wasn't long ago, but it felt like a lifetime stretched between then and now. Memories still flooded in, along with the emotions they brought with them. Would her family remember her if she returned? Or had he taken them from her as well? Swiped her from their memories as he had swiped them from hers? It was past closing time and the broom swept lazily across the shop floor. She noticed her reflection in the window. She hadn't aged at all. Had only been a year. Her hair was done up in such a way that framed her feline ears. But now it contrasted with the makeup that streaked down her taut cheeks. Maribel? Called out a voice that startled her from her days. Is that you? Mrs. Beadle was still in her apron, carrying a full paper bag in her arms. Oh dear, what's happened to you? Where are your shoes? Mrs. Beadle took Maribel's hand gently in her own. She pulled and twisted, checking her over for injuries. She wouldn't find any sign, since all her scars were on the inside. Come on then, let's see if we can't find you some shoes or some socks. Get you something warm to eat. I don't want to be a burden, Maribel said. She barely knew the Beatles, aside from an exchange of greetings here and there. She hardly knew anyone in this town for that matter. She was, truly, all alone. Don't be foolish. You're always welcome here. Mrs. Beadle placed a kind arm around Maribel's shoulder and led her inside. Now, come on in. John is baking up some cherry pies for the fair on the weekend. He'd appreciate your help if you're willing. <laughs>